2002 was a big year for computer hardware. The rough edges were taken off Intel's Pentium 4 and AMD's Athlon XP with the Northwood and Thoroughbred cores, Nvidia brought us some of the best DirectX 8 cards money could buy with GeForce 4 Ti, and by the end of the year, ATI flipped the GPU world on its head with the Radeon 9000 series and DirectX 9. What a better way to celebrate some of these milestones than with a gaming PC from the era. Thanks to staunch supporter of the channel Kristoff hooking us up with some hardware, I bring you my take on a high-end gaming PC from 2002. I'll keep things nice and simple. For a performance PC in 2002, you had two choices for CPUs, Pentium 4 or Athlon XP. The P4 had garnered a pretty bad reputation early on, but by this time, Intel was starting to get it together by bringing us Northwood and hyperthreading in the Pentium 4 3.06 HT. This CPU was the apex of performance in 2002, but would set you back over 600 US dollars. That's a tough pill to swallow even in today's money. Below the highest end, AMD's Athlon XP was a sensible choice with much more modest pricing as their top chip was the 2800 plus offered at 397 USD. I don't have one of those here, but I do have the 2400 plus, their main mid-range offering. As the name suggests, it was competing with the Pentium 4 2.4B, which it was able to match in most scenarios while being a significantly better value. Thoroughbred was the second major core for Athlon XP and featured a die shrink from 180 nanometers to 130. This allowed for about a 30% clock speed increase on the best chip compared to the earlier Palomino core, while only raising the rated TDP by 2 watts. The 2400 Plus is clocked at 2GHz and has 256 kilobytes of L2 cache, only half the amount Northwood shipped with, but it makes up some ground with its exotic 16-way associativity. This little guy would have set you back 183 USD on Newegg back in the day, or about 321 USD adjusted for inflation. Kristoff donated this chip along with a slew of other Athlons, which you'll see in more of my content in the future. Cooling the 2400 Plus is an art to cooling Copper Silent 2, and while it didn't launch until later in 2003, it's close enough for me. It certainly wasn't a chart topper for thermals back in the day, but is large enough and has a stout copper cold plate, so it was adequate for the CPU, and I really emphasize adequate. I don't have any exact temp figures, but if you put your hand on the cooler while the CPU is under load, you'll feel the burn pretty quickly. You know, I find it ironic that for as much flack as Pentium 4s tend to catch for their heat output, this 2400 Plus is actually hotter running than the Pentium 4 2.4B. Pentium 4s only got really spicy at 3 GHz and above for the most part. Arctic listed an MSRP of 20 USD back in October 2003, or about 34 USD in today's money, so this was a very affordable part. With our CPU and cooling decided, let's turn our attention to the main board, the Asus A7N8X Deluxe. At a glance, it doesn't look like much with its innocuous yellow PCB, but don't be fooled, this was quite an exotic board. Some of its notable features include NVIDIA Soundstorm, Dual LAN, and even AGP Pro. It was an early adopter of USB 2.0 and serial ATA as well. That might not sound impressive now, but in 2002 you'd be hard pressed to even find a SATA hard drive. Overall, this board proved to be solid and stable for today's testing. It's not flawless, but I'd definitely recommend it if you're looking at boards from this year, and wasn't too expensive for a high-end board either, coming in at 140 USD in December 2002, or around 246 USD today. For graphics cards, you were spoiled for choice, but the way I see it, the definitive cards of 2002 are the GeForce 4 TI4200 and the Radeon 9700 Pro. The TI4200 offered amazing value at its dirt cheap price as long as you were fine sticking to DirectX 8, and the 9700 Pro was at the cutting edge, offering the best performance bar none and a feature set so advanced that no games even used it for the first several months. I reviewed the TI4200 multiple times already, so we're going with the Radeon, and here I have a heavily modified 9700TX with an Arctic ATI silencer and reflashed with the 9700 Pro V BIOS. The memory wasn't quite up to snuff for the higher speeds, so I dropped it down to 300 MHz but this is only a 3% difference, so it's going to have a negligible effect on the performance. You'd think this top-of-the-line card came in at ridiculous money, right? Well, try 399 USD, or around 700 USD today. These days, 700 bucks will only get you an upper mid-range card at best. Our memory is a 2x256 megabyte kit of DDR400xA data, and yes, this is another part that isn't quite spot on with the times. If you had DDR333 in 2002, you were balling already, but 400 megahertz wasn't out of the question for an overclock setup. With a cast latency of 2.5, it's nothing to write home about, but 512 megs was a decent amount of RAM for the time and wouldn't have broken the bank if you went for DDR266. Higher speeds like 333 and 400 would have been a fair bit more expensive though. While I couldn't find how much this precise kit of memory 
memory cost. You could buy a pair of 256 megabyte sticks of OCZ DDR400 memory on Newegg for 192 USD back in November 2002. And that would be quite the tidy sum for today, about 338 USD adjusted for inflation. With that, I want to give a massive shout out to Kristoff, as all of the parts I've mentioned up to this point have been donated by him. So thank you very much for making this build possible, man. It took me a while to get to the video, but it's finally here. Now getting on to everything else, I don't often use period correct hard drives because they're slow and inconvenient, but I had to make an exception this time because the drive is so damn fun. It's a proper old hard drive, a 40GB Quantum Fireball LCT20 from 2000. It's ancient and slow as hell at just 4500 RPM, but its loud bearings and seek noise give it a lot of character. Every time you open up a game, the heads are like, let me sing you the song of my people. I generally tend to steer clear from older PSUs due to reliability concerns, but the majority of Athlon XP boards require a strong 5 volt rail, so it's kind of hard to get around it. I wanted to play it safe and use something with minimal wear, so I found a new old stock Thermaltake Tough Power 420 watt from way back in 2004. It was recommended to me by Pixel Pipes, who's had one since it was new. He's put his unit through the ringer, and to this day it hasn't given up on him, so I definitely trust it. This thing can handle up to 40 amps on the 5 volt rail, so it's way more than enough, and the original box makes a pretty nice display piece too. Unlike the 2005 gaming PC where we used an old, high quality Antec case, we're using a newer and much crappier case by them. It's the NSK4100 and despite being manufactured in 2019, it has as many features as the case from 2002. It gives you no modern amenities aside from USB 3.0, has a top mounted PSU, still has 3.5 inch and 5.25 and inch drive bays, and an unpainted interior so it checks all the boxes for an old build. Credit where it's due, it's somewhat sturdy and well put together, but it has loads of rough edges that will slash your hands into ribbons if you're not careful building in it. I didn't capture much footage of me building the PC because I was busy, well, building the PC, but here's a bunch of clips of it in action. My OS of choice is Windows XP as it's just so easy to use. It definitely would have been the new kit on the block, but was rapidly gaining market share over Windows 2098. We're using Service Pack 3 since we're testing both games of the time and the future, but keep in mind it does strain the system a bit more compared to the earlier packs. This would make a pretty good Windows 98 rig too if that's your thing, all the hardware is supported. And like the last PC build, we're going to bench two setups, one in stock settings to set a baseline and one overclock to find out how much more we can coax out of the system. Seeing as I've never tuned an Athlon XP before, I did a pretty crappy job with my first overclock. I brought the CPU's FSB up to 150MHz and adjusted the memory ratio to keep our RAM running at its stock settings of 400MHz with a cast latency of 2.5. This gave us a little improvement over stock, but it was much less than I was expecting. It was so slight that I was debating even including it. However, HBlank saved the day here with some great tips, one of which was to keep the memory and FSB frequency in sync. And that's exactly what I did. The memory would run at only 300 MHz, but with tighter 2226 timings. This would end up doubling the performance improvement, so while the overclock still doesn't make a world of a difference, it's at least noticeable now. I was even able to squeeze an additional 3 MHz out of the FSB at stock voltage, bringing the final clocks to 2296 MHz on the CPU and 306 on the memory. As usual on the channel, I don't exclusively test old hardware with contemporary software because I think it's important to see if setups can hold up to the demands of the future. After all, most people that buy this stuff new would be holding on to it for at least a few years, so what good is a system if it doesn't have any staying power? As far as I know, no games released in 2002 with DirectX 9 anyway, and that's arguably the 9700 Pro's most defining feature. So as a result, we have a pretty mixed test suite of games ranging from 2002 to 2008, with most falling closer to the early 2000s side of the spectrum. I benched each game three times and then averaged it out to get my numbers, and I chose the run with the loosest frame times for the grab. All footage was captured from the 9700TX's DVI output with my generic USB capture card. It definitely produces some screen tearing artifacts, but gets the job done. With all of that said, let's now dig into some testing. 
Starting off with DirectX 8 era titles, our first game up is Serious Sam the Second Encounter, and I benched a 95 second long built in demo with the quality preset. The system put down 58 frames per second on average, and overclocked us jumped up 9% putting us just above the 60 FPS mark. Frame times were okay with a handful of moderate swings being the only thing to note here. Ramping up the demand is Illusion Softworks' Mafia, and results were captured with the same one minute route just driving around. At the high preset we scored 38 frames per second, while overclocked were a healthy 18% faster at 45. However, frame time results were quite inconsistent from run to run. Sometimes we'd go through the bench with only minor swings, but other runs could have some pretty large spikes sprinkled in random places. They were far enough apart that it wasn't too much of a pace breaker though. Following up is Unreal Tournament 2003, and we're not going easy on this thing with the game pretty much maxed out. In a run of UMark's CTF Magma demo, we scored a respectable 51 frames per second on average, and our overclock brings us up 16% to 59. Unlike Mafia, frame times were extremely consistent between runs and were actually fairly good. Overall, it rarely experienced any noticeable performance issues and scaled up great with the overclock. A lesser known game from the developers of Hitman fame, IO Interactive, is Freedom Fighters, and we're maxed out again with the high settings and trilinear filtering. In my standard minute of the first level, the system managed 89 frames per second, with the overclock bumping this up to a nice and round 100, or 12% up. With my first overclock, we saw only 3% scaling, so the game definitely likes RAM and FSB being in sync. We didn't see any large stops during our run, but there was some moderate micro stutter that made the game feel a bit slower than the averages would make you think. A challenge for all but the highest end graphics cards of its time was early 2004's Far Cry, and it's also our first DirectX 9 game in the suite. Resolution is staying the same, but we picked some modest settings with a medium preset, 4xAF, and tested with the Harbor OC benchmarking tool for consistency. We averaged 46 frames per second, and overclock results were pretty much the same. Frame times were alright, with the former half being a bit messy, but it sort of picks up after that. With how GPU intensive this game is, it's pretty much a given that's our bottleneck here, but even so, the 9700 Pro is able to deliver respectable results. Our first racing game is Need for Seed Underground 2, and I benched it using 80 seconds of a circuit race with the quality slider set to here. Stock the setup put down 33 frames per second, and with our overclock dialed in, this jumps up 12% to 37. Average frame rates stayed very consistent between runs, but not frame times. At first it looks like the overclock setup has significantly better 1% lows, but this wasn't necessarily the case. Either way, the frame time spikes were pretty noticeable in this one, but it's far from game ruining. Stepping the resolution down to 1024x768 for the next two games, we have the original collector's edition of Half-Life 2 running with the high settings, 16x AF, and reflections set to world as all would have a pretty severe performance penalty. At stock we averaged 35 frames per second, and overclocked this got a very nice 23% bump to 43. This is another game that saw better scaling with the second overclock, as before it was only up by 9%. In fact, we're seeing well over 100% scaling, so I'm assuming that the tight memory timings are playing a part here. These are decent averages for the settings, but unfortunately the game experienced quite a bit of stutter throughout the run, and huge hard stops up to or exceeding a whole second. I think those were caused by the old hard drive though. Every time it froze, I'd hear the drive clicking away. Another new game in my testing is Star Wars Republic Commando, and I tested with the high preset and a quick run with some combat. The system put out 34 frames per second, and overclocked this increased 15% to 39. Like Underground 2, stutter is noticeable and fairly frequent, but it wasn't bad enough to sync the experience altogether, and some adjustments to the settings could smoothen this out, I just like using presets to make it easier to reproduce. The last game is a bit of a wild card. I was looking for something way past the hardware's time that could still run decently on it, and HBlank put me onto Trackmania Nations Forever. I was able to step the resolution back up to 1280x1024 with a nicer preset, and use 30 seconds of gameplay to get my numbers. The system cranked out 29 frames per second here, and overclocked were up slightly by 7%, but much better than the 0% scaling we were getting with the first overclock. Frame times were extremely tight with no noticeable dips during gameplay, so I can gladly forgive the 30fps average. Hplank mentioned this game has pretty tasteful shader usage, and I'd be inclined to agree. It's a great looking game considering we're on a 9700 Pro. To throw in a very CPU focused test, we've got Cinebench 2003. In stock, we scored 251 points, with the overclock increasing this 15% to 289. There's not much else to say other than the scaling is pretty much exactly in line with how much we bumped up the frequency.
So at least in stock form, this CPU was never meant to make big numbers, and it really shows with how much overclock scaling we saw in these games. The 2400 Plus simply isn't enough to bring the best out of this 9700 Pro. But despite this, it doesn't mean your experience is going to be poor in games. Our three titles from 2002 all performed well while using the highest graphics preset available in 1280x1024, so it's fair to say this system would have been more than enough for high-end gaming in its time. It even held its own decently in newer games, sure they're far from perfect and some settings could have been tweaked for better performance, but as I said I like to use presets where possible to keep things easier to reproduce for you guys. Overclocking didn't net us a huge performance boost or anything, but if you're willing to put in some effort dialing in your settings and keeping it stable, it'll help even the odds of this graphics card at no cost other than your time and a little more power consumption. Let's not forget that this system still has some room to grow with newer components. After the thoroughbred chips came Thornton and Barton, with the latter offering double the L2 cache and a decent clock speed jump on the best chips. This opens up some potential for faster graphics cards, especially if you overclock. This board also supports up to 3 gigs of RAM, so memory capacity is a non-issue. All in all, it's a versatile platform with a lot of upgrade potential, it would have served someone well for at least a few years. I think it's interesting to see ways each company was making headway during the times, with Athlon XP's die shrink, DirectX 9, Serial ATA, and DDR 400MHz RAM being the standouts of this build, at least in my opinion. I think it represents a time of rapid development on almost all fronts, and while development on the CPU side is still as fierce as ever these days, I think graphics wise things have really plateaued. Before I sign off, I'd like to give a huge thanks to Kristoff for donating so many of the parts shown here. Needless to say, this video would not be possible without him. I'd also like to thank HBlank for his tips and helping me clean up the script. Much appreciated, guys. Well, that about does it for this build. If you've had any experiences with computer hardware from this era, maybe even some of the parts featured here, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. With that, thanks for taking the time to watch to the end, and I'll see you all in the next one.